Good singing. Praising of the Lord. Hallelujah. If you have a Bible with you, Acts chapter 16, if you would please. Acts chapter 16. There's never been a time, I don't believe, in the history of the earth, at least not in the last 2,000 years, when people who claim to be Christians need to pray more or harder, more consistently about all that's going on in Israel, in Iraq, and all the rest of the area over there. But you do understand, our first battle is not over there. It's over here. And if you don't realize you're, if you're saved, if you don't realize you're at war as a Christian, you have got your head so far down in the mud, it's unreal. Did y'all see the news this week of the teenage girl in Tennessee? A classmate sneezed, and she looked at the classmate and said, bless you. And the teacher got hot and mad. Who said that? She spoke up and said, I did. Why did you say that? Well, my pastor and my mother taught me it was polite and proper to do something like that. We ain't having any of that godly talk in here. And they suspended her for overly religious conversation. If you don't realize you're at war, we are in a spiritual battle. Our Lord tells us that from Genesis to Revelations. I know we want to be peaceful. We, I like harmony. I like cooperation. I like peace and calm. And I, I, I do, I do. But I also like to be able to stay Christian and not have somebody telling me I can't be Christian. And in order to stand up, and let others know, I'm going to be a Christian. Are you? You come back tonight. You be here before 530 so you can get a good seat. Bring your own seat. Put it where you want to. And I am serious. I will not, I will not apologize for telling you, if you can come tonight and you can watch the movie we're going to watch, and it not stir you a little bit, you probably ain't saved. And I mean that. I mean that. It's good. And we certainly need to be realizing, just as the example I just gave in Tennessee last week, and a, a teenage girl being told she can't say, bless you. She didn't even use God. I, I saw the interview with her. She didn't say, God bless you. She just said, bless you. And some people out here in the world around us are so wicked, so ungodly, so dead set against anything that might look godly, that they'll launch out against something like that. Now, what are we going to do? We're going to sit around, twiddle our thumbs. We're going to be, you know, that's just one of those things. That's just one of those, yeah, just, that's just one of those things over yonder in, in Iraq. Just one of those things. They got on black suits and they waving their black flags and swinging swords and cutting off Americans' heads and crucifying the Christians from the, of the Kurds that's in northern Iraq. Crucifying them. Wow. What kind of day are we living in? If I doesn't if get your attention, I can't help you. I can't help you. But now we're in Acts chapter 16. We're trying to look at the life of Paul, and Paul is one of those that we can learn a lot from, especially in light of persecution. And we, here in Acts chapter 16 is one of the places where uh, he has been arrested. And uh, uh, we have already seen last week how he was thrown into prison. They, they drug him down there, throw him in there, and uh, beat him uh, uh, severely, him and Silas both. And we saw uh, uh, Wednesday night we talked about the peace that passes understanding. It's in verse 25. And how that there, after being beaten unmercifully, after being shamed and humiliated in front of all the town and then drugged down there and chained to a wall in a, the middle of a cell uh, at midnight, he had the peace that passes understanding. And they were singing and praising God. Yeah! In the middle of the valley, in the middle of the horror, in the middle of the trouble, Christians still have the victory. Yes, we do. 
And so we got past the peace that passes understanding. Paul and Silas are praying there at verse 25. Look at verse 26 and what and follows. And suddenly there was a great earthquake so that the foundations of the prison were shaken and immediately all the doors were opened and everyone's bands were loosed. And the keeper of the prison, awakening out of his sleep and seeing the prison doors open, he drew out his sword and would have killed himself, supposing that the prisoners had been fled. But Paul cried with a loud voice saying, Do thyself no harm, for we are all here. Then he called for a light. And he sprang in, and he came trembling and fell down before Paul and Silas. And he brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved and thy house. And they spake unto him the word of the Lord and to all that were in his house. And he took them the same hour of the night and washed their stripes and was baptized, he and all his, straightway. And when he had brought them into his house, he set meat before them and rejoiced, believing in God with all his house. Let's pray together. Bless your word, Lord. May your word accomplish your will. May we who are in this room make sure we are walking with you and we're seeking to be victorious Christians, following in the steps of our Savior, Jesus. May we love you, Lord. May we serve you. May we worship you. May we witness for you. And Lord, may we love one another like we're supposed to so that other folk will know that we are Christians by the way we live and act. Now, bless, Lord, that your word may do what you want done in this room. Those that need to make decisions, I pray, God, your Holy Spirit is already dealing with them, that they realize there's a time to rise up and be counted as a follower of Jesus Christ. For it's in Jesus' name I pray, amen. Let me give you some examples of some things I see in these scriptures, and I trust you can see them easy enough also. The first thing I see is that there is a conviction of sin. This jailer has made a de declaration, what do I have to do to be saved? Now, what brought him to the place where he said that? What, what brought this man to the, to the point to where he was willing to ask the question, what do I have to do to be saved? I assure you that one of the first things that happened in most people's lives is the same thing that happened in his life. Verse 26, and suddenly there was a great earthquake. An earthquake. Tragedy seems to be quite often used by God to motivate us. Amen? It does now. Uh, Saul himself, uh, whenever he got right with God, it was after God had struck him down on that dirt road, blinded him, and, and on that dirt road he had an experience that he couldn't explain, and it was awesome, and uh, he had a, a terrifying experience. God met him. We could go through the Bible, and we do realize now this is not always the case. God deals with us in different ways. Uh, with Moses, he had a burning bush. With uh, Naaman, he had him dip seven times in the Jordan River. Uh, uh, with uh, Matthew, he just said, come follow me. Uh, uh, with James and John, basically the same. He said, leave your nets and come follow me. And, and, and so it, God deals with different people in different ways. But I dare say, for the majority of us, and perhaps even if you get right down to it, all of us, when we come to Christ, whenever something motivates us to that point, it's because there's something going on that's bothering us. Something has scared us. Something has hurt us. Something has got a hold on us. I, I don't know about you, but I know I look back on my life and I very vividly remember the summer of 1972 when my grandfather was in the hospital in Waycross and I went down there to visit him on a Sunday afternoon with uh, my cousins Aubrey and Linda Lynch and uh, we got down there and we went in and we visited with granddaddy and he was all hooked up to all these tubes and everything. He'd had a heart attack and apparently having a series of light heart attacks and in that intensive care I can still remember visiting with him and I love my granddaddy. Me and granddaddy had something special. He taught me how to drive a Ferguson 35. That was a good day. He taught me how to drive a Chevrolet, black Chevrolet pickup truck with three on the column. You know what I'm talking about? And I was 12 years old when he taught me how to drive that. Taught me how to grunt earthworms. That was the most important thing, yeah. And uh, all that kind of stuff, granddaddy taught me. And I, I cherish that. And we had a good relationship. But that Sunday afternoon in that hospital down in Waycross, Georgia, when we'd had our visit and the nurse came by, and you know, there was just nothing but a curtain separating one uh, patient from the next patient, just a curtain, just a curtain. 
And uh, we were standing there with the curtains on either side and granddaddy laying up there and all hooked up to all these tubes and everything. And, and we were talking to him and the nurse finally comes by and says, time to leave, time to leave, time to leave. And, and, and so we started leaving. Aubrey and Linda led the way and I started by and I looked down at my granddaddy laying on that, that bed up there and I waved at him and I never will forget it, never will forget it. I looked at him and said, I'll be praying for you. And I was walking while I was talking. About the time I got it out of my mouth, I'll be praying for you. I got out of sight. The curtain separated my view from my granddaddy. And I immediately felt like dirt. Pure dirt. Sorry. You see, I was 21, but I knew I was not right with God. I was a church member, but I wasn't a Christian, and I knew it. And when I told my granddaddy I'd be praying for him, I lied. I couldn't pray. If you're not saved, your prayers aren't worth two cents. Sorry. I'm sorry. Oh, brother, pray for me. Oh, brother, pray for me. We all have, yeah, pray for me. Pray for him. Look, until you pray the prayer to ask Jesus to forgive you and let you be a part of his family, your prayers ain't going nowhere. Oh, I heard a good sermon by Adrian Rogers last week, and he, in the midst of the sermon, he was talking about being prayer warrior. He pointed out, as something we've said several, several times in Psalms, uh, it tells us that uh, if I regard iniquity in mine heart, the Lord will not hear me. And he did a great job of going through that, just as I've studied it before, and God's Word is teaching. If you're living in sin, you know you're sinning, and you're not trying to stop it, God does not promise to hear your prayer, period. End of it. Oh, my stars, that hurts. But it's in there. You want to argue about it? Argue with God, not Daryl Quinn. I felt like dirt. I couldn't pray for my granddaddy. That was a tragedy in my life. That was in June of, of 72, and it was in November of that year that I finally realized I needed a Savior. And I, I came and I asked Jesus Christ to forgive me for my sins and be my Savior. And hallelujah, I ain't been the same since. Did y'all know that? Some of y'all don't know that. Joffrey might know it, but I doubt he realizes as much as he ought to. And, uh, uh, you know, but the thing about it is that's what God can do for you. There was a conviction of sin in this jailer's life. You see, he had been given explicit orders. Paul and Silas were, well, they were troublemakers. Remember, we, we covered that last week. Are you a troublemaker? Uh, they, they came to town and they caused trouble. And, uh, and it was plain and simple. But, but here they're in jail and put there by the leaders of the town. And they, the jailer was told, said, don't you let them go. You keep them in there. And you see, in that day and time, the standard rule was if a jailer let a prisoner escape, the jailer died, period. That was it. There wasn't no arguing, wasn't no discussing. Somebody's going to kill him. And that's the reason when the ground shook and all the bar cells began to fall off and, and the chains began to fall off the walls and all these prisoners were loosed and that jailer had enough light he could see in there. They, they, they're loose. The gates are open. Oh, they're surely all gone. I have failed. I have failed. And he pulls out his sword and he's ready to kill us. They're suicidal, ready to die. And Paul cries out, don't harm yourself. Don't harm yourself. We're all here. And you saw the scriptures. The scripture said that, that this jailer was at the point of suicide. Ah, and, and somehow in the midst of that, when he, it, well, that's the first thing. It's conviction of the sin. This jailer had it. The second thing is there's a cry of a saint. Paul is the one who cried out, don't harm yourself. God has chosen, listen to me please. God has decided a long time ago that he wants to reach people in this world with the good news of the gospel, as Romans 1, 8, or 1, 16 said, it is the power of God unto salvation. It's the gospel, the story of Jesus. And he, God, has decided that he wants to use us. What a mistake. He wants to use men and women. Don't he know he can do better? But he decided that. And in this moment of darkness, in this moment of tragedy, the, the walls have shaken, the, the, <coughs> the doors have fallen, and, and, and all the prisoners are loose, and they could have left. And that jailer's ready to kill himself and get it over. And Paul cries out, don't harm yourself. We're here. Saints are to be crying out to the lost of the world and letting them know we have the truth. Amen? We've got the answer. 
we found out what works. Jesus. Jesus. And we're supposed to be telling the story. We're supposed to be willing to get up and get out there and go let other folks know about it. Acts chapter 1, 8, but ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you and you shall be witnesses for me. Not a suggestion, not an ought to be, not a should be. It, you will be. Yeah. I'm supposed to tell the world. That's going to be a good movie tonight. Now, how many of you have seen it before? Good, good, good. It's good. It's good or the second time. I'm serious. You can you can kind of digest what you're watching. You can think about what's happening. Think about this now. Those of you that watched it, how many how many relationships get broken up because of the gospel in this movie? Think about that. How many relationships? get broken up because of the power of the gospel in this movie. You say, oh, wait a minute, preacher, we will not have nobody having a divorce and all this kind of stuff. No, no, Jesus said, Jesus said, you come follow me and your own family will become your enemies. Jesus said that. You get serious with Christ and the world will get serious with you and let you know what they think of you. Yes, they will. Stop and think about it. How many, how many relationships are going to be busted up because of the story and, and what happens in the process of this movie? It's, it's interesting. Think about that. And, but here we, we have uh, the Word of God's teaching us that Paul is the one who cried out and told the jailer, don't do anything to yourself. Don't do it. But now look at verse 31. And whenever, whenever the, uh, maybe I might have described this jailer first. After the, he heard Paul's cry there in verse 28, verse 29 said, and he called for a light, so he told one of his uh, jailer servants or whatever to bring him a light. And notice the way it's worded in the King James, verse 29, and he sprang in. You ever sprang anywhere? Yeah, He sprang in. Now, that's kind of that's what you do when you're standing someplace in the woods, in the bushes, and you look down and there's a rattlesnake by your foot. You sprang. You get, you go. He, he, he had heard this voice from, from uh, inside, and, and it was Paul. He was saying, we ain't hurt ourselves. We're all here. And he gets a light, and he gets a light, and he springs in there, jumps in there. Now, hold on, wait a minute. Earthquake, rubble, doors falling off the hinges. It's a mess. It's a, just a mess everywhere. And he had to jump over something to get over there where they were at. But he sprang in there. And you notice that it says, after it says he sprang in, and he came, and look at that next word, trembling. Trembling. Have you ever trembled? Have you ever been in a situation where you were so scared, something that just happened, and you just trembled? You ever been there? I bet you have, if you could remember it. And I bet if you thought for a while, you'd remember it. You've been scared because you just, it just makes you shake. This jailer, he, he, was, he had a sword in his hand. He was fixing to plunge that thing in his body and kill himself. Man, he was at the point of suicide. He had reason to be trembling. And he hears this voice and he, he jumps in there to where Paul and Silas are at. And, and he looks down there and he's trembling over. And, and then you notice the next thing he did? It said, uh, he, he sprang in there and trembled and fell down before Paul and Silas. Man, it's just a couple of vagabonds, just a couple of trash, uh, a couple of troublemakers. And, and what's this jailer do? He jumps in there. He's shaking and he falls down on his knees before him. And he begins to realize what's happened. Now, now he ain't got saved yet. He ain't got saved yet, but he's there. He's there. And, and it lets us know here in the Scripture that, that uh, uh, he, he's down there. And then you notice on verse 30, the first half of verse 30 said, and he brought them out. Now, that's significant. They're down in the center part of a jail, a prison. And it's, it's a pile of rubble all around. There's been this earthquake. There's not much light. It's nighttime, middle of the night. And, and so when he, he realizes he's there in front of this, this two preachers, and, and he, he gets them up, and he takes them outside. That's what he brought them out. 
They get outside when there's maybe there's a little moonlight or something and, or a fire, a light from a fire somewhere and he can see a little better and he gets them off out there and, and they, they've made their way past all the rubble and the, and the torn down gates and doors and, and they got outside. And then he looks at him and he says, what do I have to do to be saved? What do I have to do? Trembling, on his knees, scared, suicidal. That's the, the mentality of this man. In that frame of mind, somebody is ready for help. Amen. In that frame of mind, somebody is looking for some, a solution to all their problems. I got good news for you, friend. When you get down, when you get to the place you realize you can't handle it yourself, when you finally realize you're nothing, you're headed for hell, and that's where you'll spend eternity if you keep doing your own thing. Then you're getting close. Then you're getting close. This jailer got him outside the, the, the walls of the jail, and he looked at him and said, what do I have to do to be saved? What do I have to do? And then you notice what happens here. It says, uh, uh, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Yeah, there you go. That's what it says. Y'all got it? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. But you hear me, good friend. All of you over years, and look at Daryl Quinn, this preacher for the morning. I'm going to tell you something. You tell me you believe on God, you tell me you believe that Jesus Christ died on Calvary's cross and rose on that first Easter morning. You can tell me you believe that. But if it has not made a difference in your life, you don't really believe it. You don't. You don't. That's just like standing in them bushes I was talking about a while ago and looking down and seeing that rattlesnake. I was deer hunting up in Twiggs County years ago. Had my 30 alt six in my hand, and I was off scouting in some woods I'd never been in before, way back down in the uh, Oak Muggy Management area. And I was walking along there, and I was trying to, it's in the middle of the day, and I was doing some scouting in an area that I hadn't been before, and I wanted to check it out. And I knew there was a lot of deer and animals and all up there. And uh, I would come across up to a little branch, little, little, little branch, not big at all, just a big ditch. And I went to step over a fallen pine tree that was laying in a pile of the brush, you know. And I picked my leg up and went to go over that pine tree log like that. And I looked, and just on the other side of that log, stretched out and looking straight at me with his mouth like that, was a cotton mouth water marker. Them boys is mean. They ain't rattlesnakes. Rattlesnakes ain't nowhere near as mean as a cotton mouth water marker. Am I right, Sam? I am right. I am right. A cottonmouth water marker to come hunting you. They'll look you up. They'll try to get in a boat with you. Oh, rattlesnake will go the other way most of the time. I looked down and I saw that snake. He was a good un, a good un. And he was looking at me and his mouth was cocked open. I could see the white of them jaws in there. And I done had my foot within a foot of him. I backing up on one leg, <laughs> looking around saying, oh, you, you, you realize how close I was? I was about that close to be in history. I was a long way back down in them woods by myself. And if I'd have got bit by that boy, I'd have been in bad shape. I guarantee you, I was close to be in history. And, and I just want you to know, I, 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 I didn't kill him because I didn't get the chance. <laughs> He got away before I could. But I want you to understand something. A water moccasin that's looking at me with his mouth open, me and him got a bad feeling going on. Trembling. Scared. Something bad can happen. It can. This jailer knew he was that close to dying. And he was going to kill himself. And so he's crying out. What do I have to do? to have what y'all been singing about. Oh, that's good. They'd been singing, praising the Lord. What do you think they were saying? Thank you, Lord, for my salvation. Thank you, God, for forgiveness. 
Thank you, God, for your blessings on us. Thank you, God, that even in this jail, you are still Lord of Lords. And this old jailer and all the rest of them prisoners, they've been hearing Paul and Silas all night. It was after midnight by now. And they've been hearing him in there singing and praising and praying and all that stuff going on. You know most of them have done, if they could have got a hold on them. You know how it is. Some of y'all, when somebody really gets to praying long. <clears throat> Look here. Verse 31. They said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. Verse 32. And they spake unto him the word of the Lord. He heard the word. How much word you got to hear? Obviously, you ain't got to read the book of Deuteronomy. You haven't got to read the whole Psalms. You got to hear that a man named Jesus died on Calvary's cross. Amen? I like, I like the way I heard it. I've heard it done. This is good. This is real simple. We believe in a Christ who was virgin born. We believe in a Christ who sinlessly lived. He never sinned one time. Though he was peccable, he never sinned. He never sinned, if you know what peccable means. And uh, uh, he never sinned. We believe in a Christ who died on Calvary's cross. We believe in a Christ who rose from that grave on that third morning. He come out of there. The jailers done passed out because they saw an angel come down rolling the stone away. And they got scared to death and just fainted over there. And he come out. We believe that. We believe that he ascended to glory and there were the disciples looking on. He went back to heaven. And that angel stood up there in the cloud looking and said, why y'all gazing up here? He's coming back. And we believe Jesus Christ is coming. I believe he's coming soon. Can't be long. Can't be long. We believe that when he comes, he's going to take all who are saved and eventually go back to glory with him. And we'll be together with the saints, our loved ones that's gone on before us. My daddy, my granddaddy, we'll see him again. Woo, glory! We believe it. If you don't believe the things I've just said, my personal opinion is you go going to hell. That's my opinion. You're welcome to yours. You die and see where you go. We believe. And after he believed... The Bible lets us know, verse 38, and he took them the same hour of the night, he's talking about the jailer, took Paul and Silas, and he washed their stripes, and he was baptized. You know what that means? Now, hold on. For us, it's not like it was back then. I've told you before, I had the privilege of knowing an evangelist named Rocky Freeman. He was a, a Jew, grew up in a full-blooded Jewish family, going to Jewish synagogue and all that. And uh, had whole chapters of the Old Testament memorized before he was out of elementary school. But he got saved when he was 21 years old. And he became a Southern Baptist evangelist. And he told us that when he went down to that little Baptist church, he had, had a date with a girl that took him there. He said he got there and he heard that preacher preach on Jesus of Calvary's cross. He got under conviction. He took off down to the altar and he asked Jesus to forgive him for his sins and be his savior. Wow, his family chewed him out. But that wasn't the worst. A little while later, when he finally got baptized, his family didn't chew him out anymore. He went home to his mom and daddy and he looked and they had taken everything that belonged to him and taken it outside of the house and piled it on the street corner for trash. They wouldn't talk to him. he walked up in the yard and they'd look away, spit on the ground and walk off. I remember Rocky telling us the last time he saw his mom was in, in Nashville, Tennessee. And said he could go up there into a little hill above the home where he grew up and mom and daddy lived in that house down there in that subdivision. He could look down there in that subdivision. He could see his mom and his daddy in the yard walking around doing all the things. He said he, one day he saw his mama down there in the yard working with her flowers. And he walked down there and walked up into the yard, come up behind his mama and called her mama. And she turned around and saw him. She spit on the ground 
and walked off. It's the last time he saw his mama. For them to be baptized, hold on, to be baptized means you made the final decision. You've decided. Now there's some of you in this room need to decide. You can tell me you believe in God, and I can tell you you're going to hell anyway. You just like the demons. The demons believe in James 2, 19, but they ain't going to heaven. I can promise you that. You got to do more than just believe that Jesus is who he says he is. You got to be saved. Jesus called it being born again. It's when we come to God and we ask him to forgive us for our sin, and we mean it, and we ask the Lord, take my sins away, wash me clean. And when we say that, God has the power to take all, every dirty, stinking thing you've ever done, said, or thought, and wash it away. Amen? Boy, I'm glad he can do that. See, I ain't the same guy that Joffrey knew when I was 10 or 12 or 15 years old. No, I'm not. Thank you, Jesus, I'm not. Paul and Silas told those things to this jailer, and the jailer came to be baptized. That means he's willing to let the whole world know. That's what being baptized is. It's saying to everybody else, I believe that Christ died and rose, and I'm going to follow Christ in believer's baptism just as Jesus was baptized. I want to be baptized. And that jailer was baptized. To follow Christ. Wow. What must I do to be saved? Did you hear me now? You can tell me you believe that Jesus is the Son of God all day long, and that will not make you a Christian. It will not. You've got to be saved, born again. You've got to come to that place. I grew up with a, a fellow, he was my best friend. He was my next door neighbor when I was little. His name was Cecil. Cecil was redheaded, and it fit him. Me and him got in trouble one day, and Mama whooped us both. I'll never forget it. Of course, she did it many times, but this one particular occasion, she had us in the kitchen, me and Cecil. And she bent me over the chair first, the kitchen chair. Wore my, anyway, out. I squalled. Oh, that hurts. She grabbed Cecil. We, he's family. He, his last name was different than mine, but he's family. Mama treated him like family. She grabbed Cecil and put him across that same chair. She started working on his other end, and I can still remember what I saw and heard. He wasn't going to cry. Mama beat him and beat him and beat him, and she'd bend over and look at him. He'd be... He wasn't going to cry. He wasn't going to scream. He wasn't going to let Mama know it hurt if he could have it. He was just that kind of fella. Me and Cecil grew up. He came down here with me several times to Baxley. About a month ago, got a phone call from him. I haven't seen him since we were in high school. I mean, we went our different ways. He found some pretty girl named Linda. He forgot about Daryl. <laughs> yeah. He called me about a month ago. Daryl, and we was talking on the phone. When I realized who it was, how you doing, how you doing, all this stuff, hey, hey, hey. And he said, Daryl, I knew Cecil well, knew his mom and daddy real well. They were church-going folk of another persuasion. Another persuasion. That's all I tell you, it wasn't ours. On the phone, he said, Daryl, will you baptize me? Cecil. Uh, you know what you're saying? Yeah, will you baptize me? I said, Cecil, we've got to talk before I can do that. So I know we're close friends, but, but I've got to talk to you about some things before I'm willing to get in the water with you and baptize you. About three times, maybe it was four, in that conversation on the phone, he said, will you baptize me? Will you baptize me? I've tried to call him several times since then. I haven't, we haven't connected We connected yesterday. 
got a meeting with him this week. We're going to eat and talk. But my wife came back from a visit in Warner Robins a week or two ago. And a mutual friend of Cecil's and mine told my wife, Cecil's got cancer. Why does it so often take tragedy before you come to God? But it does, doesn't it? For the overwhelming majority of us, and don't go acting all pious on me, the majority of us in this room, God has to just about slap us down before we'll humble ourselves and admit he's Lord, he's Lord, and I'm just a worm trying to serve him, amen? So I've got a prayer request. This week, please pray for us fella named Cecil. But I'm going to tell him about Jesus. And I want him to get saved. Maybe he is. But I want to make sure. Because me and him as buddies for years. Best of friends. Oh, by the way, I'm just trying to be what God wants me to be and crying out with the gospel of Jesus. Is that what you're supposed to do? Yes, it is. You're supposed to lift up your voice and tell your friends, your loved ones, your neighbors, whoever. You have not been saved to just sit on a pew and soak in the gospel of Christ and the good singing and the praising the Lord like we've heard in this room this morning and then you just sit there and let the whole world go to hell because you're not willing to get out there. Time to rise up. Time to report for duty. All hands on deck. We are at war and we're losing people every day. Who will rise? Who will speak up? Oh, I know. Preacher, that's not my gift. Preacher, that's not my calling. Then you better reread the book. Witnessing is not a calling. It's a command. It's a command. You shall be witnesses. Are you? Are you? Lord, help us. Let's pray. Lord, in this room there's all kinds of needs. But God, I know the first need is that people be willing to humble themselves before you and let you forgive us for our sins and save our soul. Lord, I pray that we would be willing to rise up and be called Christians, followers, of Jesus. Lord, help us. In this world we're living in, it's becoming more and more obvious that the majority of the people in this world don't believe in you, Lord. They despise you. They don't want anything to do with you, nor do they want anything to do with us. But God, may we be faithful to you. May we serve you. Thank you, Lord, for Applin County. Thank you for South Georgia and the, the buckle of the Bible belt of the world. Thank you for neighbors and friends that, that go to church and worship you. Thank you, Lord, for your blessings. But God, may we not shun our duty. Help us to rise up, God, and follow you. For it's in Jesus' sweet name I pray. Amen.